for a sentiment of the week in which the fish are said to be shot, which is the cardinal Kelvin trait archetype in pastoral center. Today we gather for the second lecture in the inaugural Father Reginald John Lecture series. The first lecture, which was delivered last week, focused on Father Reginald John, and its title was The Man, the Priest, the Christian. Today's lecture is entitled The Pastoral Approach of Father Reginald John, and it will present, be presented by Monsignor Patrick Anthony, who is to my immediate right. Many of us may have heard of Monsignor Anthony, either through his work in culture, through the Folk Research Center, or his Lucian talk, which is on Facebook or Instagram. But just to let us get a fuller sense of the person who will be presenting to you today's lecture, I invite Deacon David Popo, who is the director of the Pastoral Center, to give you a brief bio of what Senior Patrick Anthony. Deacon Popo. Good morning, brothers and sisters. So it's my pleasure to just to give a brief bio on behalf of our lecturer today, Monsignor the Honorable Dr. Patrick Papa Anthony. Monsignor Patrick, well known as Papa, is a unique figure in St. Lucian history, both in the society and of course within the religious history of St. Lucia. A dedicated priest of the Roman Catholic Church, and he was from the start very committed to making the faith of the majority of St. Lucians, and indeed the wider Caribbean, relevant to their lives and the culture they knew. Monsignor Pava is a former director of the Pastoral Center. He returned to St. Lucia, if I remember, in the 70s. And from the original seminary, St. John Vianney and the Ugandan Matters. And it was a time within the Caribbean of cultural and political awareness. There was a cry everywhere for self-identity that took the citizens of our islands past colonialism and it's of course embedded with its racisms and prejudices. There was a new generation, a new generation who were more educated, more conscious of the wider world through the news media and increased travel. <clears throat> On the brink of independence in the second development decade in the 70s, the islands were more politically conscious and indeed impatient to be free of colonial domination. The Caribbean and St. Lucia were looking again at their folk cultures, finding value in what had once been rejected in favor of European ideals and were clamoring for a rightful place to be given to the nation, language, songs, dances, dress, language, music. In other words, to what God gave us within St. Lucia and the Caribbean with respect to how we nationally expressed our culture and thereby trying to understand God. As a young priest, Pablo came out of the ferment that followed the Catholic Church's Vatican II in the 60s and the effects that brought to the Caribbean Catholic Church. He returned home with the ideas of a Brazilian educator, Paulo Ferri, in adult literacy, ideas of indigenization of the church, sparked by Vatican II, and of course, a commitment to making the church more meaningful and relevant to the people. We recall that instead of Latin masses, the pre-Vatican II era, 
the call was for masses and songs in native St. Lucian Creole. As a parish priest, as a young parish priest, Pavel organized a number of groups of young persons in the parishes where he ministered to, to sing local songs in worship, but within, of course, the Caribbean music styles, and at that time, to dress in Caribbean dashikis, which was then very popular. The church groups were encouraged to be more involved at the grassroots levels of the parishes. The process of enculturation was being cemented. But this young St. Lucian priest was even more radical. Not only did he turn the traditional conservative church upside down, but if a group of young St. Lucian students, he, he formed what was then called the Study and Action Group, which began to study and reflect in a formal way the society and its way of life. Out of this process, the Focus Center came the Focus Center and its media programs that brought for the first time to the wide St. Lucian public authentic information on the folk culture of St. Lucia. Journey to the folk ways of St. Lucia was heard throughout St. Lucia and many parts of the Caribbean region. It was a popular program on Radio St. Lucia through which there were many listeners who learned of the St. Lucian folk and the traditional culture. For the first time, and that is significant. The cultural heroes and stars of the hills and valleys were brought to the attention of the wider society. A generation grew up in the 70s, the 70s which marked the second development decade for us in the developing countries, for the first time, knew more about the island, its history and culture, but from the eyes of the indigenous persons and peoples. Out of this work, the institution of the Folk Research Center was built with its documented resources of audio and visual materials, research papers, which are still an invaluable source of information for local, regional, and international researchers. The now national event of Juni Creole was born of these efforts. And for those who will be viewing on social media, we are now in the month of October, where the entire month has been dedicated to celebrating our Creole traditions. The orthography of Creole was settled and dictionaries, a New Testament and other materials in Creole were published with the full support and involvement of the Folk Research Center. Of course, there is so much we can say about Monsignor Pavel over the years, so time will not permit us to give more details on the work of Monsignor Pavel and the work that he has done within the cultural development of St. Lucia, but also as well insofar as culture is the form of how God speaks to us spiritually, we are really indebted to Monsignor Patrick Anthony. His work have left an indelible mark on modern St. Lucia, a generation that now forms the leadership of this country with an influence beyond our shores, was shaped and matured by the vision and work of Monsignor Power. Because of his influence and in work, he was often called on to be a mediator during the turbulent years of the political changes within St. Lucia. And that contribution was made as a consequence of his reading and understanding of the church in the modern world, especially through some of the constitutions and the documents that came out of Vatican II. For these reasons, my brothers and sisters, in a nutshell, and many more, the Folk Research Center 
and the church, not just the Catholic church, but the whole Christian community and other peoples of faith really indebted to Monsignor Patrick Papa Anthony, one of our national cultural heroes and also as well, one of the many authentic prophetic voices given a new imagination, an alternative with respect to ensuring that we can live out our faith in ways that are incarnational and experiential. So with these few words and a backdrop of Monsignor Patrick Anthony, it gives me great pleasure to invite Monsignor Pablo to give us this lecture on the pastoral approach of the late Father Reginald John. Thank you. Thank you, Deacon David Popo. Good morning, everybody. How are you all doing? How are you going? You okay? You know, we are living in very difficult times. We are living at a moment that is challenging. And it's a moment for people like Father John. The world needs people like Father John. You see, because when you listen to the news, when you see the kind of hypocrisy that is going on globally, internationally, the injustices, the unfairness, the bullying, the greed, you need voices that can really call the world to listen. A friend of mine, and Professor Emeritus, called me yesterday and was asking me about a few things. And I gave her some of my ideas. And he said, but you know, it's OK to talk to St. Lucia, to talk to St. Lucia in the Caribbean, but the world has to hear, the world has to hear. And I was saying to her, look, you know, I think the world they want to listen. The world they want to listen. <laughs> People have their agendas. <laughs> they have their stances, their positions, their interests. <laughs> and they're not interested in alternative they're not interested in the truth. I mean, today we're talking, people talking about alternative truth. Huh? Alternative truth. In other words, I am Patrick Anthony, but that's what I say. <laughs> because you can say you're not Patrick Anthony. <laughs> and that is your reality. And that is your truth. It's an alternative truth. I mean, we are, we, are, we are living a real, real, real cockeyed moment in the history of the world. And this is why it is particularly relevant for us to recall the memory of a St. Lucian who had the courage in his day to help at least our small society to be self-critical. Father John put up a mirror to the society and he forced the society to look at itself. So he became a bouncing ball. That is why he was passionately loved by some people and violently hated by others <laughs> because he was putting a mirror to them and some people didn't like what they were seeing and others liked what they were seeing. So today, I'm going to follow up on what Deacon Robert Harvey has done. He gave a little background to Father John, and I'm happy to welcome Father John's sister-in-law and uh, his niece, who is here. They're, they're here with us today, so welcome, Jackie and Moms. Big them up, big them up. 
Yeah, Father John grew up in a, as Dick Mahavi had said, I just briefly said, a large family, 15, two died, there were 13 sons and daughters from a brilliant family, a bright family. His, um, his, father, the, his father was um, a rep, parliamentary representative for Choiseul. Not only that, but one of his brothers was a prince, school principal. And I want to begin with another brother who links with Father John's vocation. So my, my presentation will be in, next slide, five parts. The call to service, cultural alienation, pastoral sensitivity, saint of the ghetto, and the fire next time. So we begin with the call to service. The call to service of Father John was influenced by a priest called Father René Roger. René Roger was the parish priest of Choiseul for 65 years. 65 years. Next slide. That's him on the left there. You can see that he was parish priest from 1894, from 1894 to 1959. Now, this priest, he knew generations of people in Choiseul. So when he met someone, he was able to give them the ancestry, the ancestry, the history, because he knew everybody. And he made such an impact on the community, that young Father John, as a little boy, felt that, wow, that's, that's, that's a man, that's a man, that's a good man. And so the seeds of his vocation were nurtured through the influence of Father Roger. His brother, Julian John, went to study in France. So that was another influence, I think, that kind of stimulated his vocation. Father Roger, yes, but his own brother. And I will talk a little about his brother before, but I also want to mention to you that at that time, there were very, very few St. Lucians. In fact, the first two St. Lucians to become priests were Jules Marie Claus and Henri Claus. These are two St. Lucians born in St. Lucia, but of um, their, their parents were of the aristocracy, Jules and Henri, and they became FMI fathers. FMI fathers. Up to that moment, there were no black FMI fathers. There were no local boys who joined the FMI fathers. So, until Father John's brother, Julian John, went to Martinique, went to France, he was the first. And I want to bring up that next slide so we can, we can hear. Go, go for, fast forward. We'll come back, we'll come back to Derek. But, yes. This is a document which I got from the French archives of the FMI fathers in Vendée about Julian John, which is Father John's brother. They said, hmm? you'll, you'll, you'll speak French, huh? you'll read French? <laughs> hey, 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 come on, come on, you're all SMC boys, right? Uh -huh. Okay, so, okay. so after brilliant studies hmm, at St. Mary's College, he became a French lecturer there. He was teaching there. Huh? But the Spirit of the Lord called him, and he decided to become an F. My Father. Now, this, this, is, this is the part I like, you know? Nous avions été très heureux d'accueillir un noir de la famille. <laughs> we were very happy to welcome a black man <laughs> in the F. My Communication. From the very early days, 
he gained the respect of his teachers and the affection of all his confreres. <laughs> so he was the first black man to join the FMI fighters. And so you could imagine what experience he had. However, he was a brilliant guy, so brilliant. Let's go back to the previous slide. So brilliant that you know who was one of his best friends at Mary's College? Derek Walcott. Derek Walcott, our Nobel laureate, was his best friend to the extent that when Derek heard of the death of Julian, he was so moved that at the time he was writing his collection in the Green Knight, he wrote a poem, an elegy for a friend who was dying. It's called Stairs One My Brother by Derek Walker. And out of it, there's a quotation. Derek is saying, I had such faith as yours. But the tides of bitterness broke over me. And the wrath of my safe cargoes perished. So Derek is struggling with his own faith journey. But he knew Julian was a man of faith. He had gone to become a priest. And they were buddies. And he's reflecting upon his death and saying, look, I know one sad faith like you. But look at this beautiful line, the last line there. Restore, if even by your death, my faith. Could you imagine? A Nobel laureate <laughs> is praying that Father John's brother, <laughs> by his death, would restore the quality of faith that, that he had. That's just to show you, I'm talking about how brilliant the Johns were, that Father John came from a very brilliant family. His brother, Julian, was the first to have gone to study for the priesthood in France. Um, next slide. Um, there were some others who had gone afterwards. This is Leon Michel, who was a St. Lucian. He was an ex excellent linguist. He went, but he did not, did not remain. If, if my father, father Raymond Lohr, of course, he's the only FMI who remained as an FMI. Then we have Eustace Thomas who is from Dominica. He is now Monsignor Eustace Thomas. He left the FMI Fathers. A few others, like Monsignor Barfelmi, had joined the FMI Fathers, but he left and became a diocesan. And so Father Reginald John went to study in France, and after a while, he left them. But I want to explain to you what I call the cultural alienation. Next slide. Oh, this is just, just some, a description of the death of Julian. And I'm sure the family, you probably have never seen that. <laughs> I got this from the archives. Huh? They're, they're, they're talking about how he, he got a fever. And it was an, in, an inexplicable fever. They couldn't diagnose. His pressure went very, very high. And then began to get fits. And they brought him to hospital. Eventually, he died at the hospital, and he's now buried, as they say. Il repose loin de la terre natale, de sa terre natale. Huh? He is buried far from his native land, hmm? the Notre Petit Cemetery in our little cemetery. So he's buried in France, far from his native land. Ne next slide. Now. Okay, so the death of Julian in France on the 2nd of October, 1953, Reginald John entered the regional seminary in Trinidad in that same year. So his brother had died in France. He didn't go to France. He went to Trinidad. He spent four years in Trinidad. And then in 1957, he went to France to join the FMI fathers. So you could see the influence of Father Roger had been so strong on him. And somehow or other, although his brother had died, and you could almost sense a, a fear of France, but he went. And now let us enter into his experience in France. 
Well, next slide. Okay, I want you to have a close look at this pig there. This, this is a pic of the seminary. You don't have a, um, a pointer? Do you, have a, do you have a pointer? You don't, okay. All right, if you, you could see to the right of that picture there, a whole set of guys in white. These are seminarians. These are seminarians who were studying for the priesthood at the time. This is the community celebrating. And in that picture, there is only one black face. The one black face. So you could imagine what an experience it must have been for that person. <laughs> huh? Next slide. Bishop Gashi, when he became the first Bishop of Castries, he went back to France to do his first Mass. This is a picture of Bishop Gashi's first Mass. If you look to the left of that picture, going up from the little acolyte, second row, third row, only black face in that picture. That's, that, that's, 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 that's the context. Hmm? Next slide. The F my fathers in those days, they wore black cassocks and white cassocks. So you can see them. These are the early F my fathers in St. Lucia. They are wearing black cassocks and white cassocks. Next slide. Father John decided that he is going to wear black cassock. <laughs> and he became known for his black cassock. So look at them here. You see the other, the other F my fathers in shirt and pants? He in his black cassock. That was a statement he was making. He was making a statement. At one point, he began to use white castle, all the, but he dared to be different. That's the point. He dared to be different. Next slide. Dr. Discus Jews, who was one of the members of my study in action group, wrote the following about Father John. I remember Father John eternally clothed in his black cassock as if it carried the, the burdens of all blackness, thundering at the pulpit at the vipers and hypocrites who, who lit pious scandals but would spare no time for the barefooted, for those who were quick to measure their own self-righteousness against the gossip and iniquities of others. For many of us, young college boys at the time, papa's boys as you refer to us, he was the saint of the ghetto. He was the one who brought Christ to Conway. He was the one who recognized the humanity in the most sinned. He was the one who recognized the divine spark, even in the most degraded of human circumstances. Next slide. Pastoral sensitivity. Father John, when he came back from France, he had a sense of his people not really understanding Christianity because it was not inculturated. It was not done in such a way that people would understand. Now, to, to, I'm, I'm, we're talking about we're talking about the sixties. Eh? <laughs> The 60s. So this is really radical thinking. For a St. Lucian, because of his experience and because of his intelligence, recognizing that the people did not somehow or other relate properly to the Christian message, decided to become creative. So for example, 
This is Good Friday. Good Friday, what are you reading? You read about, sorry, Palm Sunday, sorry, Palm Sunday. What do you read about Palm Sunday? How Jesus rode on a donkey. Hmm? But you ever seen any priest driving in don riding in a donkey? <laughs> Father John wanted a donkey. <laughs> he rode a donkey. Because he wanted the people to understand that the gospel is a real message. On Christmas, at Christmas time, on Christmas Eve, when we have the mass for the baby Jesus, what do we do? We bring in a little statue of the baby Jesus. We carry it in procession. You know what Father John said? He said, that's nonsense. Not easy to do. He used to ask people to bring a real baby. He wanted a real baby. A real baby. So th this is a kind of pastoral sensitivity that he had in which he, will, he wanted the people to experience powerfully the impact of the gospel. And unless you put it in ways that are down to earth like that, it wouldn't touch people. It would just become ritual. Father John wanted religion to become not just ritual, but reality. Reality. And that's why he did those creative things. Next slide. In that same vein, today we are celebrating Moa Heritage Creole, Creole Heritage Month. Huh? We'll be celebrating Junior Creole just now. You know who was the pioneer hmm? in Creole ministry? Father John, Father Reginald John, <laughs> long before commentators were on radio talking Creole, Father John, a Catholic priest, was preaching in Creole, <laughs> not only preaching in Creole, but he had actually composed a number of songs in Creole, so he was a composer, and he created a famous we have the cross in Creole. And that used to be played every Good Friday. That's, that's long before Dubois. Long, long, long before Dubois was born. Right? Father John was already. So in terms of the development of Creole consciousness, he was a prophet in the vanguard. I want you to listen to Father John and excerpt from his um, Way of the Cross and listen to the quality of his Creole. Jordi a se vendredi saint, jour le noka kachile en tristesse, a sou la mort Jésus, a sou la croix. Il y a 2000 ans, depuis Jésus, il y a la mort brutale pour pécher nous. Mais le passage n'a jamais oublié juste ça là. Parce que Jésus est mort par l'amitié pour nous. Moi, je fais l'idée pour faire un chemin de croix épisode aujourd'hui. Un mémoire de chemin de croix, Jésus est fait pour salvation nous. Quand je fais un chemin de croix, ça là, si tout. Les gens qui sont malades, et puis les gens qui pas un empêchement ou un lot, passent à aller prier en l'église. Avant de commencer, nous avons chanté un cantique la passion. Nous avons demandé à Jésus pour pardonner tout péché, parce que c'est pour nous qui en est cause la mort. Écoutez-nous, Seigneur. Passe nous en twistes pour péché nous j'arrive faire. Jésus c'est où qui met, c'est où qui sauve nous. A sous nous qu'a couillé, qu'on nous l'a qu'a plaué. Coute prier nous, pardon. Écoutez-nous, Seigneur, passe-nous en 
twist as poor patient, who shall we fare? Who is a lot? Dear wait, say who kiss me, say who kill him, no, net why it no pass Écoutez nous, Seigneur, passe nous à twistes pour péché nous jaouive Nous la commandions un pied en Chante yon chant qui bien tuis sa zoe you. Coute chanson nous et pardonne péché nous. Écoute nous, Seigneur, passe nous à twistes pour péché nous jaouive fait. Jésus saint à nous. C'est pour nous te marcher à, sou, à sous la croix. C'est par l'amitié pour nous qui fait aller mort à sous la croix. Et malgré tout ça, nous abandonnons. OK. So, what this is showing is how, how radical Father John was in his understanding of Christianity. His understanding of what Today, we take for granted. Everybody say, oh, June Creole, yeah, yeah, celebrate, yeah? In those days, <laughs> in those days, that was a lone voice, a lone voice, crying in the wilderness. And not only crying, but defying the establishment by going on radio, huh? going on radio and doing it. So that you can, and why? Because he had that pastoral sensitivity. And of course, he was motivated by the response of people because everybody, everybody loved Father John's way of the cross hmm? because he was touching them, he was reaching them. And you know, so, so the, when you talk about P P Father John's pastoral approach, you can see how deeply, deeply rooted he was in his people, in his culture, in his experience as a black man, that's why he was not going to throw away his language, throw away his culture, and his, no, himself. No, you know, a little joke, Fajon always used to say to me, I, I told Jackie that already. Fajon used to say, you, Baba, you know, I have royalty, you know, I have royal blood in me, you know. Yeah, he said, he said yes, yeah, he said, he said he's, de he's de descended from some African prince, and, and so, so, so he has royalty in him. And so he doesn't want, Nobody can tell him who he is. He's got his self-confidence and his identity. So in St. Lucia, we had, a, we had an expression, Queen Jaja. <laughs> Queen Jaja. A lot of people have heard Queen Jaja. So we say, yes, Father John, we know you have descended from Queen Jaja. But in fact, when you do research, Queen Jaja is a historical figure. Queen Jaja is a historical figure. So, you know, there we laughing and joking, folk memory, but there is some truth in it. However, the point I was trying to make is Father John's intelligence and also his pastoral sensitivity. I want you to listen to a witness, a testimony by someone who is going to help you to understand the kind of person that Father John was. Marilyn Gaston will give us testimony. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. De le bagay ka wive nou an la vi nou, epi nou ka kwe la pani yon bon di, me i toujou ka vwe on moun pou ban nou, on ti kom solasyon. An bagay wive mwen, le mwen te pli jen. Kote ke, twa nom te ale la me vie fo, epi yo jwen ni an boutey, an di dan la me ya, ki teni twa potwe mwen, e pi on lek ki teni ekwiti an le. Eko sav bon die vwe yon moun, 
même joie yo porter bouteille là la caille moi bay papa moi on dit voye fada john puis venu là pour te ban moi teasing consolation pour moi pas te paix parce que moi te paix mate ça 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 veut dire et dis-moi comme ça fimoi ou sam ka dormi en souye bon dieu il dit maman et puis papa ou sam ka prier de red ba ou et pour ni l'autre monde ka prier de ba ou parce que ça yo joine là ça c'est go 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 tiens bois et puis ça c'est un bagage ka prier la douive et puis ou peut chancer il pas ni t'en servir ou parce que là yo kwè ou te ka stri en bas la place là ou te soufouye sou pa te soufouye ou arrive jik seve san si pa seve san ou ka arrive matinique alors il fait moi am pa pè rien encore et qui dit moi toujours mettez la foi en bon dieu parce que si la pa teni en bon dieu ki jide bagay sa la ki te ka arrive ou pièce on pa te ka sav ki ki divini ou ou te ka divini alors Father John bon Dieu voyez ba moi prêter sa tie pèwèz la dan moi et puis moi ni la foi en Dieu glory 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 to God c'est pour nous mettre la foi nous en dit dans Dieu parce qu'il toujours ka voye en consolation ba nous Father John rest in peace Father John fait un chai bon travail en simplicité merci I don't know you all you all don't um, how many of you all understand creole a few of you all a few of you all okay yeah it's she's giving a story about how um some fishermen went out to sea and they found a bottle in the water and in the bottle was three pictures of her and some kind of a note or a prayer so they brought it back and gave it to her and when when at the time father john came and the mother was able to call father john to try to explain what was happening and he explained to them what was happening is that this is really obia chemba what they call chemba and the people trying to do things to affect you so the idea of a picture in the bottle drifting on the sea was that she was going to be condemned to living a, a drifting life right. so he was able to pray for her and save her from that kind of situation but th- that is just an, another example of the kind of work that father john would do not only preaching not only inculturating but a spiritual guide was able to help people to deal with difficult situations okay we'll move on father john the saint of the ghetto um from the compendium of the social teachings of the church it says this the principle of a universal destination of goods requires that the poor and the marginalized and in all cases those whose living conditions interfere with their proper growth should be the focus of particular concern to this end the preferential option for the poor should be reaffirmed in all its force this is an option or a special form of primacy in the exercise of christian charity to which the whole tradition of the church bears witness it affects the life of each christian in as much as he or she seeks to imitate the life of Christ but it applies equally to social responsibilities and hence to a man of living and to the logical decisions to be made concerning the ownership and use of goods today furthermore given the worldwide dimension which the social question has assumed this love of preference for the poor and the decision which it inspires is as in us cannot be embraced cannot but embrace 
the immense multitudes of the hungry, the needy, the homeless, those without health care, and above all, those without hope of a better future. In other words, we have this concept, what we call preferential option for the poor. What does that mean? It says this, that every human being has certain rights. Every human being is entitled to proper conditions for living as a human being. Because the basic thing is that we are all human beings. And every one of us has an equal right to dignity. Now, you would have heard some people talking, calling other people, looking down on people, like children of a lesser God, you know, no, no, no regard for people's dignity. In the eyes of God, every human being is equal. You could be poor, you could be rich, you could be tall, you could be short, you could be black, you could be white, you could be whatever. Every human being has equal dignity before God. What does that mean? It means that the whole world, all the wealth, all the property, all the resources of the world are for everybody. It's for everybody. Now, just follow that. If everything that is in the world is for everybody, and some people are greedy, and they have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, hmm? what's going to happen to people? There'll be poverty, there'll be hunger. So, the, the teachings of the church is this, that as Christians, we believe that God did not make his world for some people to have a lot and other people to have nothing. All the wealth of the world is to be shared for everybody. So when you have some people who have a whole set of money and they can do all kinds of things with their money and others who are hungry and poor, it is part of our responsibility, our social responsibility, that is what we call a preference option. We have an option, a special responsibility for those who are in need, those who are poor, those who are challenged, those who are different, those who don't. And this is the official teaching of the church. Now, Father John understood that. He understood that. This is why in his work with the, what we call the street people, the wharf rats, those whom people turned their backs on. He gave them priority in his ministry. So apart from all he had done with quail and so forth, he had a special passion for the needy, especially the young boys and the young girls and the young people who had nothing. Father John, would, his last cent, he would use it to, to, get, to feed them to care for them. But you know what happened as a result? As a result, many people felt he was what the priests have to do with these people, these people, these war frats, you know, good for nothing. And so, as I said, he was a prophet. Many, many people supported him and said, good work, good work you're doing. Other people say, Meh, I don't want anything to do with it. And in his own words, he tells us what, what he did once. Next slide. Next slide, please. This is Dr. Jules. In a tribute, he said, I remember Father John ostracized for harboring hordes of wolf rats and vagabonds in the Cathedral Presbytery and having to rent a rundown shack in Goodlands to accommodate the, his children of God. We volunteered on August holiday to help him to teach and organize these boys. And I remember him every day telling them that they were the image and likeness of God and that no circumstance of poverty should negate their dignity or shame their blackness. 
So this is because as a young man, remembering how Father John used to explain to the boys, don't let anybody. Welcome, girls. Welcome. Yes, we welcome the comprehensive school girls who have just arrived. But I wanted to listen to what Father John himself told us in an interview that was done for the Catholic Chronicle. Listen to Father John. Next slide. I brought my boys in early at the 7th a.m., 7.30 a.m. Sunday Mass. During the homily, I asked them to stand and I asked, what do you expect from these people? They answered, Christian love. I asked, what do you expect from me? They answered, Christian love. I then invited them up to the sanctuary. <laughs> Father John continued, some people were scandalized, but I wanted to bring out what is Christian love for them. I see helping the poor not as a favor, but an obligation. One cannot go by what one denied, what one derives from it. One does it for people and forget about self. So this was the kind of thing that Father John would do, which is to rile up people. So for example, as he said, all these same people whom they consider war frats, hmm? street boys, troublemakers or not. He brought them all in church. Put them all in church. And when he went to the pulpit to preach, he asked them to stand up. And he challenged them. He told them, what do you, now listen, could you imagine that? These war frats, hmm? these good for nothings, Saying to him, he's asking them, what do they expect of these people in the church, the congregation? <laughs> so the same people who don't like them. He's asking them, what do they expect of them? And they say, we expect Christian love. Then he turned and asked them, what do you expect of me? They say, Christian love. And now, <laughs> to put the knife deep inside, he called all the children and said, come into the sanctuary. <laughs> well, squawka, let me tell you. <laughs> you could imagine pandemonium, pandemonium. Because, you know, what desecration, desecration is the same thing that used to happen because he used to bring the boys in the presbytery. And my gosh, it was, oh. But Father John maintained this. If you don't understand that in every human being, no matter his or her situation, Christ is there. If you don't recognize Christ there, then you're not Christian yet. You know the story is told about Mother Teresa, who was um, some journalist wanted, they heard about Mother Teresa and the great work she was doing. So they decided to come and spend a day with Mother Teresa. So Mother Teresa, during her day, of course, she goes through the streets of Delhi. She picks up all the sick and people with worms on them and sores on them. She brings them to the convent. They clean them, give them food, and take care of them. And at the end of the day, when these journalists, whose stomachs were turned, <laughs> and who, who were who could not stop holding their noses because of what they At the end of the day, they said to Mother Teresa, you know, Mother, one of them said, you know, Mother, I really admire what you do. Hmm? I admire it. I couldn't do it. More than that, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. You know what Mother Teresa told him? Neither would I. Neither would I. In other words, I'm not doing it for money. <laughs> I'm doing it because I see Christ in them. It's Christ I'm serving. 
That is the spirituality of Father Reginald John. He understood that in the poor, in the needy, in the vagrant, in the abandoned, in the marginalized, Christ lived. And so he is serving Christ in them. And no matter what criticism they gave him, and they gave him a dusty time, he still persisted. And he served them. Now, Father John was not a saint. He was not a saint. In other words, he was not perfect. He had his shortcomings. He had his limitations. Huh? He had his weaknesses. And in fact, <laughs> I, I say that to some people, Father John was a coward. <laughs> he was a coward, you know. <laughs> you see all the big voice. <laughs> all the big voice. He had a conviction of faith, yes, of course. Once he's preaching the word, he had a conviction of faith. But in himself, he was a very shy person. Very, very shy person. <laughs> and the family will tell you that. Some people will say, when you say, Father John, boy. <laughs> but he was a very shy person. Very, very shy. And, you know, I lived with him. I lived with him. And for, I lived with him for a number of years. So much so that Father John got me to play carnival for the first time with the study and action group. We had a band. <laughs> we were advertising diamond cigarettes. <laughs> so Father John had his, his boys in his van, and we were in t shirt with a t shirt band. <laughs> Father John got us to play. Yeah? T shirt. So, so the, he influenced all of us. And that is why my own passion for the poor and my working with street people, St. Lucy's home and all these kind of started, is out of that spirit of Father John. But I was just telling you that, that he is a very gentle person and he was a coward. He was a coward. One, one, Father John was a bleeder. He was a bleeder. You know what a bleeder is? There's some, some people, they, they, um, when, they, when they get cut, when they get a cut, their blood does not coagulate. And so they have to get special help for their blood to coagulate, or else they can bleed to death. Especially when they do things like an extraction, and so they have to be under certain special conditions, or else they can bleed to death. And he was a bleeder. So whenever he had any situation, he was very, very scared, meticulous, to make sure, because he knows what it could be. And one day, <laughs> I was in the presbytery with Father John. <laughs> and I'm hearing him going, ba, 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 ba. <laughs> So I was downstairs. <clears throat> I run upstairs. <clears throat> I said, what's wrong, Father John? Father John had a spate of hiccups. You know when you have hiccups and you can't stop? Hiccups, hiccups. Huh? Huh? And Father John, I, 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 I am. <laughs> I said, Father John, it's only hiccups you have. It's only hiccups. <laughs> only hiccups you have. He said, but, 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 but. It's not stopping. It's not stopping. It's not stopping. <laughs> of course, it took a little while, but eventually it stopped. And when we realized that Father John's health, was deteriorating, particularly in terms of his dentures and the possibility of constant bleeding, and which might bleed to death, we were able to arrange to get Father John to go to the Bahamas. A priest friend of mine arranged for him to get some treatment. But Father John was afraid of flying. <laughs> He did not, he was afraid of flying. We tried everything, everything, everything. He said, no, no, once it's flying, he ain't flying. Anyway, eventually we coerced him and somebody was able to go with him. He flew to the Bahamas. When he flew to the Bahamas, he got part treatment. Hey, hey. When Father John came back, I said, how was it? He said, but that was nothing. <laughs> 
from that day, <laughs> Father John began to fly. <laughs> to fly everywhere. <laughs> and this is how he landed in the United States, you know? He could, because they were always inviting him to the United States to come and preach and so forth. And he never used to go, you know? But now that's the Father John, hey, he said, flying is no big thing, you know? <laughs> so he went, he went to the United States, and of course, when he reached there, there was openings for him, and particularly in terms of his health condition, he could have gotten treatment. So he stayed, he stayed in New York. But however, in New York, next slide. In New York, the same passion that Father John had here, he carried it over to New York. And just listen to Listen to this about Father John. Hmm? That is after he left St. Lucia, after he had overcome his illness and got treatment and whatnot, after he had overcome the fear of flying and had gone to New York and was welcome in New York, Father John, in the early 80s, left for St. Lucia for New York, where he worked in the parishes of St. Peter Claver and Gregory the Great in Brooklyn. Then, at a, he was served as a hospital chaplain on Staten Island. At the time of his death, he was attached to the parish of St. Anthony of Padua in Bronx. And listen to this. And was employed by the city of New York Department of Corrections as a chaplain. So his concern for prisoners, for the poor and so, continued in New York. So when he went to New York, he was doing the same work. And listen to this. Huh? He worked along with Mother Teresa's sisters with the street children of New York. So whereas St. Lucians were giving him pressure for working with street people in St. Lucia, when he left St. Lucia, he went to New York and he worked with the street children in New York with Mother Teresa's sister, uh, sisters. But not only that, he served as a chaplain at Rikers Island Correctional Facility. Rikers Island is the most dangerous prison correctional facility in New York. All the real bad, bad, bad mafia, Rikers Island, that's where they send them. Father John worked as a chaplain there. But not only he worked as a chaplain, but listen to this. He was to retire on the 31st of December, 2003. He had recently received an award from the New York City Commissioner of Corrections for outstanding, dedicated, outstanding and dedicated service. In other words, the head of the correctional facilities in New York. All the great gangsters, <laughs> the, 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 the Al Capones, uh, people like that, huh? all the big mafia, Rikers Island, that's where they are. Father John was a chaplain there, and the head of the correctional facility gave him an award for his dedication. You see that? So look, here we have a solution. Hmm? A St. Lucian who had done so much in St. Lucia, so creative, eventually left St. Lucia, went to New York, and continued his ministry in New York, hmm? and reached a point where he was able to work in one of the most dangerous prison facilities in the entire world, because Rikers Island is noted as one of the most dangerous, and he was a chaplain there. And he was rewarded, awarded by the prisoner, the, the head of the correction facility for his work there. So, Father John is really an incredible St. Lucian, an outstanding St. Lucian. In a way, he is one of our moral and spiritual giants. This country has produced Nobel laureates, 
outstanding people on the fields. But if you look for somebody who has in his own simple, I said you as a coward in many ways, <laughs> shy way, and yet still, brilliantly, has done so much for the church. That is why today, Father John is dead. Father John left St. Lucia so long, he went to New York. You know people still calling me Father John? <laughs> people don't know me, huh? When, 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 they hear, when, when they hear about it, they say, hey, hey, Father John, Father John. So his name remains a legend because of the ministry he has done and the contribution he has made to St. Lucia. So I'm really want to big up Deacon Popo and the Pastoral Center for this initiative to help us to come this, to discover fresh this brilliant, outstanding St. Lucian priest, Father Reginald John. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. I concur with a number of things that Monsieur Patrick Anthony um, gave us, the information that he gave us. But my, my association with Father John was at the age of 12, and he encouraged me to be an acolyte. And uh, myself and, and, and Desmond um, B Biscom, or, or you, by the church, Bascom by the church, and um, a number of other guys. And we, we decide we're going to do this. So he used to see mass very early in the morning, and we had to get up and be with him all the time. Now, we were not a member of his boys. That's, he, this happened late after we joined him. Um, but Father John was a really, really fantastic individual. I remember myself and Desmond Bascom he told us, look, why are we turning our backs to, to the congregation? And uh, he looked at Desmond and he laughed. And I said, well, you know, that's how the Catholic Church has the altar. And, you know, he never did anything about it and he keep complaining. So one day I told him, why are you saying this? He said, this is not the right thing. We're supposed to face. I remember, I don't know if some of you remember that time. We were supposed to face the congregation. And he never did anything about it. Until at last one day, he said, it's going to be done. We, the priests, the archaics, everybody going to face the congregation. But Father John was such a brilliant priest. He knew what was coming. So one day he, he looked at us, and I think I was the only one there. Bristol. Bristol was there. David, David, um, Len, Len, David Lenny. Right, right. And he, he told us, he had a carnation milk box at the back of his van. And he told us, you see these people there? You see all these names on the pulpit? And we're gonna, we're gonna really and truly talk about it. And he, had, he, he took a hammer from Mi Mr. Glass, which was the chief maintenance man for the presbytery. Uh, I'm, I'm happy you're helping me. <laughs> so, um, so at that time, he had the hammer in his 
in the carnation box. And he said, we're going to do something. And we never thought, Father John, after everything, the mass is over, right? He said, follow me. And he started ripping off the name tags on the, on, on, on the, on the pews. And he reached to a name and he said, we're going to stop there. Because you know what he saw? He saw when, while he was preaching, everybody was behind and the front area was partly empty and he wanted the same thing what, what Monsieur Anthony was saying, that everybody has to be one. And in front of him was empty. And people didn't like that. And the, the people now did not like the way he approached the names. And I, I don't know who, who moved the rest of the names, but he had them in a box. And he was saying, I have done my bit for the day. Now, uh, my experience with him uh, when it comes to preaching, he would really give them, like, like Father said, he'd let the bourgeois, he called them the bourgeois, and the petty bourgeois. He saw them as really and truly um, not leading the rest of the society because they had money, because they had business, and they were greedy, and everything was, as long as I give the church some money, I pay for this, I pay for that. These people used to give the church so much money in those days that he got mad at them for that. And they were hypocrites. He called them hypocrites. And I'll tell you, in his homily, he didn't, he did not relent. He let it all out for them. Yeah, but let me say one thing. Well, let me say one thing. That, that um, Father John used to bring us to the prisons, and Monsieur Patrick Anthony spoke about it. And he would say mass for the prisoners. We were afraid, but Father John wasn't afraid. And he said, how do you see God? And a prisoner would say, well, I don't see God because I'm here, you know? And he would, you know, I mean, I have a lot to say, but, but you know, things like, things like burials, and one last thing, things like burials. He expect every door to be shut. Remember, we used to follow the dead right up to the um, Chaussee Road. And Elwin used to open the door, everybody used, and he used to throw ho holy water behind them. And, and you'll see all doors shutting, bam, 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 you know? And I could go on and on, but let me tell you, man, this guy was my favorite priest, and he really opened up, really opened up the society. Now, I have a lot to say about, he had liked Papa a lot, but I would like to make, at some other time, make a comparison between Papa and Father Albert, Father John. I, would, I want you guys to give me some time to make that comparison because these, these um, human beings saw the society in a certain way and they wanted to change it. You know, Papa did his, right? Father John did his. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you, Brother Benji. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I think I'll start with a very side note one. What community was he parish priest to? 
I think I recall you saying you as parish priest to a community. Was it here? Father John. Yes, here. Which community was that? Big song, okay, thank you. <laughs> but I'm very interested in the transition between what the Catholic Church was then and what it has become now. So um, I'm very happy for this invitation here because I think I got, I think even in one individual life you can learn a lot about St. Lucia's history and I did quite a lot see it here. Um, so I'm very interested in what Catholicism was then when you know we didn't see any, well, when there wasn't anybody like that looked like us or spoke like us in the clergy, there wasn't anybody in that that broke that glass ceiling yet. But um, yes, because even now you said it how we have mass in Creole, how we how we I mean look at you, Monsignor, you have your African print, we have our Saint Lucian prints. So particularly during that very integral time in Saint Lucia's history in the seventies, even before Saint Lucia was independent, in the sixties, in the fifties, it I was very interested. Well, I was very happy to see the dates, you know, his birth date and his brother's birth date. Um, and to see those photos of them, that single black face, I think that's something that, you know, it's very lovely to see ourselves represented in those, but also real, realizing that they're human. And of course, some injustices were done. They didn't have a stellar time where it wasn't very movie magic. It was tough and they, they went through a lot. So um, my question, yes. So one, I'm interested in the transition. If you can just bridge more on it, you spoke on one life and a very extraordinary one. Thank you for also bringing up, uh, up the human aspect of it, that he was, how you experienced in your, um, in your life with him, how he was kind of a coward. I, I enjoyed that. <laughs> um, so yes, the transition and also um, where is information about like any of his works or any other trailblazing solutions where they may be Found. I'm not too sure if it's at the Folk Research Center or the archives specifically, but all those decades ago, photographs and videos and any information or persons who are interested in answering those questions. Thank you. I have um, the, we have a few, a few books. Um, we have the History of the Catholic Church by Bishop Gashi, Charles Gashi. We have the outline history of St. Lucia by Father Charles Jess, who wrote the national anthem. And we have, we have um, the, we have the history of St. Lucia part two, still to be written by Papa Patrick Anthony. <laughs> no, one, no, the point you raised that there's a lot of stuff that we need to outright. Mm -hmm. We need to write, and that's one of the good things that this this um, lecture series is raising. Because we don't have we don't have written stuff. I used to edit the Catholic Chronicle, and that is one of the places you will get the transition information. You will see like a ball by ball. I mean, every week, um, every month we publish once a month. No, is it weekly? Month for month. I, I can't lose. <laughs> Every month you used to publish, so you'll get a, 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 a ball by ball, monthly, kind of stories about everything that happened in the Archdiocese. So if you were to follow over a period of time, we have the, we have the chronicle bound. Huh? So you will be able to, we go back from, I became the editor in 1981, I think. And from then we have been, we have all the bound copies until we stop publishing. So that's one source for the history. And it is, I'm happy that you're interested. We really want people to begin to go and write, and write. Because people like myself, we're getting older, so we'll be gone just now. We have got, there's so much stuff to be done, so much stuff to be done. Mm -hmm. And you mean, Father, just, Father, Father John is just one person. I am doing research on the first St. Lucian first black St. Lucian. And I discovered that, in fact, before the Kloss brothers, who were white, they used, there was a, there was a, a father, Flosak, who was also 
St. Lucian, but he also was white. But then long, long before them, there was a St. Lucian who was born the descendant um, of a slave, and he was black. He wanted to join the, F, the Holy Spirit, Spirit and Fathers, but he couldn't join the priest in St. Lucia. He was too black for that. He tried to go to Haiti to join the, um, the, the Holy Ghost Fathers in Haiti. They did not accept him. Again, he was too black. <laughs> But he worked in Haiti, because Haiti was a liberated place. And he reached a point where he became the vicar general of Haiti, a St. Lucian. And there is a story, which I'm researching on. He became so famous that around the time when the revolution was taking place in Haiti, the royalists were fighting the the Haitian revolutionaries, and that priest hid some of the revolutionaries in his church. And the general, the French general, got word that there were revolutionaries in the church. So they came with guns blazing to the church. And that priest, a Saint Lucian, you know what he did? With all the revolutionaries hiding in the church, he took the blessed sacrament. He took the monstrance, the blessed sacrament, and he went in the front of the church with it. Now, the general and all his soldiers, they are very good Catholics. In fact, the general used to be one of those carrying the, the reposoire <laughs> during processions. When he came out of the Blessed Sacrament, they all knelt down, all knelt down, and he blessed them, and they went back. The revolutions were hiding in the church all that time. From that incident, they named the area in Haiti after him. So I'm doing research on that first St. Lucian. Press time, you'll get it, you'll get it soon, no <laughs> time. But it's, it's fascinating, very fascinating story, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, um, I know time is coming again, so is there any before? Because I know the students have to get back to their classes and stuff. Um, let, me just, let me just ask a question. How many of you presently, um, students, are doing history at your school. I plan to do history for CXC. You plan to do history for CXC? One person, one student. Okay. Okay. It is important. The reason why I ask that I'm aware even when I I went to St. Mary's College in the 70s, in the 70s, so that gives some sense of my age. And even back then, fewer and fewer students were choosing West Indian history to study. And so I know nowadays, when you look at the results, out of a class of 150 students, you may have 30 students doing West Indian history. We know fewer and fewer students wanting to do West Indian literature. And because we have start, stopped seeing the value of those subjects. But as you could have said, and I've watched a number of you just hearing the history of something simple of, of what one person did in St. Lucia, we can see the, the importance of knowing about those stories because they help us appreciate and value ourselves even more when we see what those persons have done. So I encourage you. I encourage you, even if your, ch your choice is not to do history, you, not, you do not stop being aware and learning about what has happened in St. Lucia in the past. So speak to your parents. Speak to your parents. Ask your parents what it was like when they were growing up. What it was like when they were growing up. So that you start knowing what it is like. Because Telephones and the, the, the phones and the computers which we have have radically transformed the world which we live in. 
radically transform the world which we live in. In my time, I told you, I grew up in the 70s, you used to have to send a letter, and a letter took two weeks maybe to get to England or a month. Nowadays, with an email, it's instant. So your world is radically different, but you need to understand what happened before, what people have accomplished before, and so it helps you have more pride in yourself as individuals and in your country and what it has achieved. Okay? So, let us give Monsignor Patrick Pat Anthony a round of applause for today's lecture. So, so we have come to the end of the second lecture in the inaugural Father Reginald John Lecture Series. Um, it was a lot to unpack, so we are happy to inform you that tomorrow, that is tomorrow, Wednesday, the 11th, you can view this series on um, the Archdiocese of Castries YouTube channel or its Facebook page. So it will be there, and so for those of you who came in a bit late, you can see the beginning and hear on whatever, because quite a bit was given to us, and it is something we can return to. Um, so we just solicit. We also would like you to spread the word to your friends, to your parents about the lecture series so that they too can watch it with you tomorrow or if they don't want to watch it themselves. The third lecture, the next lecture in the series will be the Eucharist and the Poor and this was by His Grace Archbishop Kelvin, Archbishop Gabriel Malze and that that um, lecture will be showed next week, Wednesday. So tomorrow, Wednesday the 11th, we will have the lecture which was presented today by Monsignor Patrick Anthony. And next week, Wednesday, we will have the lecture um, given by Archbishop Gabriel Mahazer, which will be the Eucharist and the poor. Um, we also extend an invitation, well, to you if you have the time or your parents again, and we really need your help in spreading the word. We also ex extend an invitation to you who would like to be part of the in-person audience for the fourth lecture in the series, um, which will take place on Saturday, this coming Saturday, 14th October at 10.30 right here in this same place. Um, we invite persons to be here. So again, share with your parents, share with your friends. You may not be able to make it yourself, but if you know of persons, just spread the word that the lecture will, there will be another lecture here on this Saturday, October 14th at 10, 10 15 a.m. The topic, Poverty Reduction Strategies in St. Lucia, and this lecture will be presented by Dr. Ezra Jabatis. Dr. Jabatis is a St. Lucian. He is also a social development practitioner who has had extensive work experience in this area, having spent many years working with the government of St. Lucia and the organization of Eastern Caribbean states. So, the first two lectures, it focus on the person, Father John. The third lecture will start moving from the person and seeing how, what Father John did and what for we as Christians, we are now, the Eucharist is a call to us as all Christians to be part, helping with preferential option for the poor. Then the fourth lecture will now focus, as we said, on what is happening. Because sometimes when we talk, it is many times when you hear the talk, it's always about criticisms and not what has been done. And so the fourth lecture will talk about what are some of the things which have been done to address poverty. So we again, Saturday 14th at 10.15 right here. So on behalf of Deacon Popo, the Board of Management and Staff of the Cardinal Kelvin Felix Archdiocesan Pastoral Center. I would like to thank our sponsors. Yes, we got some sponsors because if you turn behind you, you'll see some juice and some water. So that costs money. So we would like to thank our sponsors, Domino Pizza, Janu Credit Union, and Cox and Company. Let's give a round of applause for our sponsors. We really, we really, I mean, we, 
we know as students you have other commitments and stuff, so we really want to thank you for being here in person. Because it, it, you can just do a virtual lecture, but it's always useful to the lecturer or the presenter that they get the energy, they feel the vibes when they speak into a group of persons, even if it will be broadcast at a later time. So we want to thank you for taking the time to be with us uh, in person for this lecture. So give yourself a round of applause. Um, we will thank those who will view the program online. And finally, we want to encourage persons who are, when they have viewed this program and for you to give us feedback on the program. We would like to know what you think of it, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you think we can do. Because it's always about doing better. So once again, we look forward to you joining us, whether online or in person, for the four remaining lectures. And we say thank you. And God bless. Take care.